Good morning or good afternoon, librarians. It is wonderful to be here with you on this lovely autumn day here in New York City. I am Chris Vicari, Director of School, Library, and Retail Marketing for Union Square and Company. I both welcome and thank you for joining us now for our third annual Get Your YA on Author Showcase and Book Buzz Preview. Today, you'll hear from four delightful authors about their upcoming YA books that we all think will make a nice fit on your library shelves. Immediately after that, we will have a short book buzz title preview from me and our three other sponsoring publishers, Dina Sherman of Disney Publishing, Laura Lutz of the Shet Book Group, and Amanda Cromarco of Wednesday Books and Flatiron Books. Kicking it all off today is author Annie Cardi. Her book, Red, publishes on the last day of January 2024 from Union Square and Company. Think of Red as a reimagined scarlet letter. In it, a teenage girl is stigmatized by her peers after seeking an abortion in this timely retelling for the Me Too era, perfect for fans of Speak and Groan. Kirkus Reviews just called it, quote, a heartfelt tale of an ostracized teen who finds caring people and a way through trauma. Annie has an MFA from Emerson College and currently lives with her family in the Boston area. Please put your virtual hands together and say hello to Annie Cardi. Hey, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Annie Cardi. Um, I'm a way YA author from the Boston area. So shout out to people zooming in from New England. Um, my novel, Red, is coming out at the end of January, and it's a contemporary YA retelling of The Scarlet Letter centered around abortion and grooming. Uh, like a lot of other American teenagers, The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne was part of my high school English literature curriculum. Growing up in New England, I knew it was about the Puritans in Massachusetts and a character who gets shunned by the rest of the colony for getting pregnant out of wedlock. At the time, I was looking forward to reading it, and it sounded kind of scandalous and romantic. It's actually called The Scarlet Letter, a romance. So as a teen, I assumed this meant it was going to be focused on the love between Hester Prynne and the father of her child. Once I read it, however, I was so pissed. I wanted justice for Hester Prynne, who spent years living in the woods with the Scarlet A on her clothing, rejected by everyone she knows, while Arthur Dimsdale, one of the leaders in the community, got to live his normal life. Dimsdale had to deal with his own guilt over the situation, but that didn't seem fair compared to how Hester was treated. I kept wanting Hester to climb on onto the top of the scaffold and say, hey, I didn't get pregnant all on my own. Of course, that's a lot easier to say than to do, even if you're not a woman living in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1600s. By the time I read The Scarlet Letter, I already knew girls who were shamed for their bodies. I'd heard guys made in, making inappropriate comments and getting away with it under the guise of joking around. I'd seen grown men who initiated inappropriate contact with teens. It all happened around me and no one ever said anything because what could we say? Who could we tell and what would even happen? When I started thinking about the story that would become read about five or six years ago, I knew I wanted grooming and some kind of imbalance of power to play a part in the story. For me, that connected well with what I saw as a teen reader in The Scarlet Letter, dealing with single mom Hester Prynne and Puritan minister Arthur Dimsdale and their very different standings in their community. In Red, Tess, the main character, moves to a new town and joins a youth group and a church choir led by a charismatic and seemingly kind youth minister, Alden. Tess is dealing with some difficult family dynamics and the youth group and choir give her solace during a hard time. She ends up connecting with Faith in a way that she didn't know she needed and Alden ends up taking advantage of that. Unfortunately, this is something we've seen in all kinds of organizations from youth groups and religious communities to women's soccer and gymnastics to school settings, any setting where there's an imbalance of power and the potential for someone to exploit that. Also early on in the planning stages for Red, I knew that unlike Hester Prynne's A for adultery, there was another A word that's deeply divisive for contemporary religious communities, abortion. I knew that this would be central to Tess's story and it's where the story actually starts with Tess and her mother driving to a medical center so that Tess can get an abortion. I wanted to connect with the opening of the Scarlet Letter in which Hester Prynne is already dealing with the fallout of her relationship with Arthur Dimsdale. Additionally, I wanted to have a story in which the decision to have an abortion isn't the culmination of Tess's journey. It's a significant moment in her life, but she also goes on to find her voice and speak out against abuses of power in her small town. After her youth group friends reject her, Tess bonds with the kids she finds rehearsing in the school music room during lunch, 
and they're honestly some of my favorite characters in the story. Uh, Tess finds solace in music, not only singing in a group, but starting to play guitar and write her own songs. When she starts to see that others in her town have been harmed and shamed in similar ways, she puts together a group for people to share their experiences and organize resources and try to make change. Abortion is a part of her story, but not the entirety of her story. It was also important for me to write Tess as a teen for whom faith ends up being a really important part in her life. Um, even as she struggles with being ostracized by her peers and hiding the truth about what happens with, happened with Alden, she wants to have a connection with God and a faith community. I grew up Catholic, and while my home church didn't have a youth group, I played in the church handbell choir, which was essentially a youth group for extremely nerdy teens. I wouldn't have called myself a particularly religious kid, but I really enjoyed that sense of community and the idea of being able to connect with a higher power who understood and cared about me. And there are a lot of YA readers like that. Um, according to a Pew Research study from 2019, more than eight in 10 American adolescents say they believe in God or a universal spirit. And I love books that show that aspect of teen life, like Saints and Misfits by SKLE and Good Enough by Paula Yu. Um, so it's important for me to include that for Red. While my agent and I were early in the submission process for Red, the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Like a lot of other people, I was upset and angry and worried for all the people who would lose necessary medical care. Um, my agent and I ended up having a big conversation about what that meant for a YA book that deals with abortion. We talked about edits that would need to be made. Um, for example, changing the location um, in the story from Tennessee to Virginia um, and Tess wondering if her mom would get in trouble for helping her access care. We wondered if we should continue with our submission plan or if we should hold the book for a time until the topic wouldn't be so raw for, edit for editors and readers. We ended up deciding that we still really believed in the story and wanted to get it to readers who needed to hear about a teenager dealing with the stigma of having an abortion and breaking the silence around her situation and forging a community of openness and support because of it. We were thrilled when my editor and the team at Union Square felt similarly. Uh, Tess is fortunate to have a supportive parent and a way to access care, but that's not the case for many people in the U.S. I know that there are a lot of people who will see that this book deals with abortion and not want to read it or want others to read it because of the topic. Um, it's a, an extremely difficult time to be a librarian or teacher or bookseller. Like you're dealing with organized attacks from books from a very vocal minority and a lack of support and funding from administrations and local leadership. Um, and that's on top of everything people are already dealing with. It's tough out there. But pretending that these books or topics that don't exist doesn't do young readers any good. Teens need honest, nuanced books about difficult situations. And I hope that Red can be there for readers who may need to make the same cho choice that Tess does and who should know that they still deserve love and hope and even faith. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for connecting books with readers who need them. Um, and with that, I will pass things off to Dina. You'd think by now I would know how to take myself off mute and <laughs> off camera. Um, thank you so much, Annie. That was wonderful. Um, I am so happy to now introduce Sarah Das, who's the author of It Waits in the Forest, which is one of our YA titles in the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. Sarah was born in Trinidad, but her family moved to Tobago when she was two years old. She's been telling stories since she was a young child. And at the age of eight, when she ran out of Nancy Drew novels to read, she decided to try writing her own. She would later go on to attend the University of the West Indies and the University College London. Sarah grew up in a seaside resort in Tobago and draws inspiration from her experience living there. She hopes readers like her, who love Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago, Tobagoian, sorry, Sarah, you're going to have to correct me on that one, or Caribbean set fiction, enjoy and connect with her characters. Thanks for joining us, Sarah, and take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, it's Tobagonian. You, you're close. You almost got it. <laughs> um, hi, I am Sarah Das, author of young adult books, including the upcoming It Waits in the Forest. It's a supernatural thriller inspired by Caribbean folklore. Like Dina mentioned, I am myself, I'm Trinidad and Tobagonian. Um, and storytelling is not just a big part of my life. It's a huge part of our culture here. 
Um, the Caribbean in general has a complicated history. And from this mix of cultures came the stories of supernatural creatures that have been fascinating and scaring people for generations. I mean, I still remember as a child sitting on my grandmother's front porch, my grandmother in her rocking chair and my cousins around, and she'd tell us these creepy stories about supernatural creatures that she claims to have seen late at night, back in the days before there were street lights. And then my uncle, who would take us on hikes through the rainforest, and he'd fill us in on the history and legends of witches and jumbie spirits that lived in the trees and haunted the area. And then also just at school, being in class with my classmates gathered around someone's desk and we'd trade scary stories trying to freak each other out and someone always claiming that they definitely, definitely knew someone who'd been bitten by a sequina or chased by a lagahu. All that is to say that with writing, it waits in the forest. It feels like finally my turn to get to tell one of these stories. The book is about a teenage girl named Selena, who, who after a tragic incident involving her parents, feels guilty and tethered to her island home of St. Virgil. For the past couple of months, Selena and her friend have been conning gullible tourists and desperate locals with um, fake spells and phony protection rituals and talismans trying to, and trying to convince them that Selena is psychic. But after a session with one of these tourists, they learn that the tourist is actually involved in a string of strange murders happening on the island. Uh, Selena gets wrapped up in the investigation and the only person she can turn to for help is her ex-boyfriend, Gabriel, who recently got a job at the local newspaper and he's eager to put his investigative skills to use. Together, Selena and Gabriel team up, investigate the murders, and uncover the secrets that wait in the forest. I am so excited for this book to come out. And today I just wanna to read a short excerpt from the book. Um, just to set it up, I'm gonna let you know that it happens during Selena and Gabriel's investigation early on, right after they've discovered a secret passageway. I return my attention to the small door, pushing it a little wider meeting the resistance of a spring-loaded hinge. If I let go, it would slam shut. Shifting onto all fours, I peered inside. It's too dark, I can't see anything. Here, Gabriel, flash Gabriel activated the flashlight on his phone and handed it to me. I took it and aimed it through the opening. A person would have to crawl through the door, but the space behind opened up, high enough to stand but narrow enough to make me nervous. The gray walls appear to be outfitted with exposed brick, pipes, and wooden beams above. A short ledge gave away to a descending staircase on the right. There are steps, I retracted from the entrance to look at him. That would explain how the murderer got out and all the disembodied voices and strange sounds in the walls. Nothing supernatural about it. Right, he said, straightening up. He started unbuttoning his shirt. What are you doing? I demanded as he proceeded to strip off his shirt, revealing a thin white undershirt and a lot of rich brown skin. He had more scarring than I realized, including a line over his left shoulder that appeared to be surgical. I had the wild impulse to press my lips against it, but which prompted me to look away. I'm taking my shirt off, obviously, he said. In case it gets dusty down there, I've got to go back to work after this. Okay, but he could have given me a warning. It was just his shirt, no reason to be this flustered, and yet my skin burned with mortification. I almost pointed out that his pants would get dirty as well, but decided it might be better that I didn't. I'll go. He shook his shirt out and left it on the bed. You wait here and keep the door open. Now, before you argue with me. Okay. He snapped his mouth shut. Okay. Yeah, I had no problem with that. Confined spaces really aren't my favorite. If I didn't know better, I'd say he looked disappointed. 
thought you'd argue with me about who gets to go inside, he said. This feels too easy. I rolled my eyes. Exasperated and mildly amused. I mean, you don't have to go in there if you don't want to. This is a secret passageway, Selena. There's no way I'm not going in. This is a dream come true. A few seconds later, he crawled through the opening. I immediately, he started sneezing. How's it going? I handed him his phone. Still living the dream? He mumbled something that I missed, then sneezed again. What do you see? I asked. Dust, he said. And more dust. Apart from that, there's a spiral staircase, and it seems to be in good condition. I'm 99% certain that I'm not going to fall through to a painful death. A worrisome crack filled the passage. 98%. Please be careful, I begged, almost wishing I'd put up an argument to go inside. Almost. I highly doubt they've been upkeeping this place, whoever they may be. How many people did know about this? Were there other passages? And had it, it why had it been built in the first place? I pulled out my phone. Using the flashlight, I kept an eye on Gabriel until I couldn't see him anymore. As the minutes passed, I grew more and more nervous, straining my ears, listening for some sign of him down there. I crawled forward, stopping about halfway through the entrance. One hand held my phone, the other I used to balance on the stone floor. A musty heat permeated the air. Instead of shining the light down the stairs, I examined the space around the panel door. To the left, what I'd assumed to be a solid wall did have a small square opening. It could have been a vent of some sort. I shone my light into it and saw no end. A small person might just fit in there, wriggling along their stomach, their hands tightly clamped at their sides. With one of my feet pressed against the panel door to keep it open, I crawled deeper into the passage to get a better look. A hand reached out of the vent, its fingers curled over the edge, jet black and hairy. No. Not fingers, legs, a spider. It darted up, it darted out and scurried up the wall. I screamed and dropped my phone, backing away from the vent. The panel slammed shut without my foot to hold it, seeking, sealing me in darkness. Okay, so that's it um, uh, from It Waits in the Forest, which will be released next year on May 14th. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am Amanda Comarco from Macmillan and I am so excited to introduce Johnny Garzavia. Johnny Garzavia is an award-winning author of contemporary YA literature with characters and settings inspired by their own identities, including Andrew and Santi were here, as well as the upcoming Canto Contigo. Whatever the storyline, Johnny ultimately hopes queer Mexican-American young people will feel seen in their writing. Johnny lives in San Antonio and enjoys reading, playing Dungeons and Dragons, visiting Taquerias, listening to Selena, and caring for their many cacti children. So welcome, Johnny, and uh, tell us all about it. Thank you, and hi, friends. Um, oh my gosh, my camera is just going everywhere. Um, my name is Johnny Garzavia. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am a product of the great state of Texas, writing Texas-set contemporary coming-of-age stories about queer Mexican and BIPOC young people growing up, falling in love and being a little messy along the way. Books that are proudly embracing Mexican and Tejana culture and queerness and what it is to exist in the middle part of that Venn diagram. And with the hope that those specifically uh, young people who exist there feel a sense of home and heart. Uh, but today I am here to talk at greatish length about my upcoming young adult novel, my third child, my problem child, um, Canto Contigo. My quick pitch for Canto Contigo has been part grief story, part rivals to lovers romance, and all about the epic highs and lows of high school mariachi. Canto Contigo is, again, a contemporary novel, but with a dash of magical realism and that sort of on my block, Jamal talking to the gnomes or reservation dogs there in his spirit guide vibes. Uh, it is a corrido dedicated to my own grandfather who was a mariachi in his life, a 
lover of music and lived many years with Parkinson's disease. And it is another addition to the Johnny Garzavia literary universe where we can expect two queer BIPOC kids to fall in love. Uh, but this time they'll have to spend a few chapters yelling at each other first. We are first introduced to um, Rafael Casimiro Alvarez or Rafi for short, a then high school junior who one walks with the confidence of a person who fully believes himself to be the next Omar Apollo, Peso Pluma, Grupo Frontera, Bad Bunny, Galeucci, Selena, you get the vibes. Uh, a Leo who spends an entire book Leo sunning, uh, but he is also a person who is facing the worst days of his life. He is saying goodbye to his abuelo, the most important person in his life, uh, who introduced him to mariachi and taught him nearly all of what he knows. He is saying that goodbye after years of only being able to watch Parkinson's slowly take his abuelo away from him. And he's doing it, having to right after, head up to San Antonio and front his high school mariachi group as they compete in the mariachi extravaganza nacional. His last words to his abuelo were promising that he'd keep going, that he'd make his abuelo proud, that he'd keep stacking up those first place trophies for him. And within the same 24 hours of time, when he is persuaded by his best friend and his cousin to attempt some fun as depressing as this moment is and go with him to a hotel room party, he meets Ray. Well, he meets a boy. He meets a boy with dark skin and beautiful brown eyes and a gorgeous smile, a boy who immediately teases him, a boy who, as they spend an hour and then two in their own little corner of the room talking, flirting, seems to effortlessly relieve some of the weight on Rafi's heart. And although Rafi is already envisioning spending more time with this boy throughout the next couple of days, considering what it might be like to drive to San Antonio on the weekends to see him, insta-loving this could be picture-perfect future with him, and hoping that he's not coming off as a small town boy who is completely brand new to kissing cute guys. Their night ends abruptly and the boy leaves without Rafi ever getting his number, his Snapchat, his Instagram, his name. And a small moment of happiness and intimacy uh, becomes just a memory. Eight months later, Rafi's life is further put into turmoil whenever he is told that he and his family are moving to San Antonio just before the start of his senior year that he will be leaving the mariachi group he has fronted since he was a freshman, that he has led to three first place titles at Mariachi Extravaganza for a school and a new group that has historically always been the far number two to his. The Selena Quintanilla Perez School for the Performing Arts and their Mariachi Todos Colores. Um, but at least they'll be begging him to be lead vocalist. This is the one certainty that Rafi can hold on to. And one that shatters when not only is he made a backup vocalist, but he meets their current lead, a boy named Ray, who has dark skin and beautiful brown eyes and a gorgeous smile and a tenacity that only drives Ray's ambition, which in turn further drives Ray's tenacity and what becomes a battle for a lead vocalist. For a chance at one last first place at Extravaganza and one that Rafi, pushed by those promises he made his abuelo, cannot lose. Uh, with parents that are just trying their best, two adorable twin baby brothers who love watching Nacho Libre, mariachi teens who are both eager to be friend with Rafi and conversely eager to dunk on him at any given moment, uh, a mariachi calavera that may or may not be sentient but does seem to be able to talk, and a boy named Ray who might just be able to help Rafi, find that love of music maybe he didn't even realize he'd lost. Canto Contigo, much like my previous novel, Ander and Santi Were Here, is a story not just of romantic love, but of familial love and of the love that we show ourselves, the love that is the gifts that we give the world and shaping our own path for our lives, paved and guided by those who love us back. Um, yeah, Canto Contigo, it is out in April. Thank you all. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Laura Lutz, and I'm the manager of Children's School and Library Marketing at Hachette Book Group. And I am thrilled to introduce you to all to Samantha Mabry. Samantha is the author of acclaimed novels such as Tigers Not Daughters, which was in Yalsa's Best Fiction for Why I was on the Yalsa's Best Fiction for Why list, as well as All the Wind in the World, which was longlisted for a National Book Award. 
Her upcoming novel, Clever Creatures of the Night, is certain to earn her similar accolades. It is suspenseful and gripping, yet also thought-provoking and literary. I am completely obsessed with it. <laughs> when Samantha isn't writing, she's teaching college-level composition at Southern Methodist University and spending time with her family in Texas. And now I'll hand it over to Samantha to tell you more about Clever Creatures of the Night. Samantha. Okay, I think that I am here. Um, the, first of all, I, um, Donna Rasmussen, I do not know you, Donna Rasmussen, but I, I think everybody here appreciates your enthusiasm in the chat. Like, it's just really wonderful. Hey! Um, it's really like lovely to see, like I do teach college level composition and my students usually just like stare at me, but Donna is like the one student who was like making eye contact the whole time and um, like answering questions and stuff. And that's awesome. Um, so my book, <laughs> Clever Creatures of the Night is my fourth book with Algonquin Young Readers, which is now an imprint of Hachette. And it's a wonderful house to have uh, written four books for, for sure. And the basic setup for this is that there is a main character, her name is Case, and she is driving up to a house in the woods to see her friend, um, Drea, Andrea, who has invited her to stay at this house for a night um, in the house where she is isolated with four other friends from school. Um, I really wanted a like drive up to the strange house uh, vibe opening, kind of like Rebecca um, by Daphne du Maurier, right? Um, and when Case gets to the house, Drea is not there. And the roommates are all very cagey about where Drea is. Like, they're like, she left. We don't know where she is, whatever. Um, and Case is just getting a really bad vibe. And her ride is gone. Her ride is going to get come back um, in 24 hours. So she's kind of stuck there to figure out what happened to Drea. Increasingly, she's realizing that something bad happened to Drea and that something bad could possibly um, happen to her as well. So um, yes, I was inspired by books like Rebecca. I was also inspired by a book called The Likeness by Tana French, right? Where you have like a house with secrets, right? Or like the sort of town with a secret motif. Um, and also I'm always inspired by like Western and noir films of old where there's some kind of ticking clock, like, like a ticking clock Western, like Three Ten to Yuma or High Noon mm -hmm. where like something is gonna happen and it has to happen in this very confined space. Um, so I do have some slides um, that Tina is just gonna go through. So these are um, from, my home. So I spent part of the time in Dallas and then part of the time in Palo Pinto County, Texas. Palo Pinto is west of Fort Worth. It's about an hour and 20 minutes of a drive. And it is where I spent most of my COVID isolation. So um, I you can a lot of times try Dre, um, not Drea, Case in the novel is wandering around this property that is also in Palo Pinto County. That's where the book is set and um, wandering through trails, kind of looking for her friend. And this is really indicative of one of those trails. We have mesquite trees, live oak trees, um, and Yes, the, the group out there is isolated. It's not because of COVID, but it was inspired by my sort of isolation out there in COVID. But there is a sense of like what happens when you, your world is turned upside down and you have to isolate and like, what do you do? Well, there's one of the girls who 
um, you know, takes up bread baking, which is a thing that people did. There's one who is just like pretending like everything is fine. Um, there's a, another of the girls who like takes care of chickens. Okay, like I don't, and, um, and I was uh, one of the very fearful people. I was convinced, um, we can go to the next slide because that's actually helpful for me to speak to. It's the same thing, it's Palo Pinto County. This is my son. Um, and he was just learning to walk. He was two years old when COVID hit. And so I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of him like stepping into ant piles. I was afraid of javelina hogs coming out and attacking us and I would have to like fight it off because um, there are hogs out there. I was afraid of snakes. This is a particularly cool vibe picture because it has the like ominous background of a thunderstorm coming. Um, but um, I didn't want to write a book about like, here's everyone's negative emotion fear happening, right? Even though that's what, what I was totally feeling. Um, so Drea is sort of like this lovely person who's missing, but who like, saw the hope in things and tried to see, you know, the gift of this sort of unexpected thunderstorm. And then, so there's characters throughout who are also not the sort of negative Nellies um, that maybe you and I uh, were, you know. Um, so the next picture also is just, again, most of the pictures have my son in them because you like take pictures of your kids, right? But this again, it sort of shows a mesquite tree and trail and the sun and everything. Um, so there is lots of, there are a lot of animals. Um, there are some of the animals, you know, like may have sort of symbolic meaning, um, but there's, you know, snakes and hogs. Um, wasps, um, you know, in ways that some people, I did a lot of explaining to my, um, no offense to Laura, but like to the New York publishers of like, uh, here's what Havaluda hog does. <laughs> um, it destroys your property and it, you know, goes through and sometimes you have to fire a rifle at the dirt to scare them away. I mean, these things that make me sound sort of funny, but um, there's coyotes and, you know, people in, in rural counties will do things like, if you do not know, like tie up coyote carcasses on their fences to like ward off other coyotes. Um, oh, one minute left. And um, so that is where Clever Creatures of the Night really came from um, is you know this place and sort of how it can be slightly scary but also very beautiful and this this friendship between these two girls and this one um, case's desire to figure out what happened to her friend despite this overall threatening aura and that can be it that's the end of the slides Great, thank you so much, Samantha. For the record, I lived in Arizona, so I am a New York City person that does know what a javelina is. Um, so now we're gonna move on to our book buzz. And here's my contact information and some of our imprints as well as uh, links to social. Uh, next slide. And obviously we've heard from Samantha, thank you, Samantha, but I wanna just briefly tell you why I'm fully obsessed with this book between the suspense of a tight 24 hour timeline, the creepy characters you can't trust, they give you the eebie-jeebies, and a missing teenager, it is unput downable. Samantha leaves just enough to the imagination, so much so that several of us in-house at Hachette, there's about a dozen of us on the thread, I think, have a very lengthy text thread discussing theories and ideas about what might have happened at the end of the story. And you'll get to come up with theories of your own when this is available March 2024. Uh, next, please. 
If I Promise You Wings by A.K. Small. So from Texas to Paris, France, that is. Meet 17-year-old Alex Leclerc. She just landed an internship at Paris's premier feather boutique where her dreams of becoming a renowned feather artist creating statement pieces that define glamour and high fashion seem closer than ever. But as Alex loses herself in this new world, she begins stealing feathers for her own use, a serious offense at the boutique, and finds herself caught in a love triangle between Raven, a brooding and handsome fellow artist that of course has made her his muse, and Blaise, an old, awkward, but charming schoolmate who's trying to offer her solace and healing even as she pushes him away. Set in dazzling Paris, If I Promise You Wings is a beautiful and lyrical story about chasing promises, overcoming grief, and of course, falling in love. And this pub's in January. Next slide. We Mostly Come Out at Night is a YA anthology that reclaims the monstrous for the LGBT. BTQIA plus community and explores how there is freedom and power in embracing the things that make you stand out. Each story centers around both original and familiar monsters and creatures, including Mothman, a girl with 13 shadows, werebores, gorgons, angels, and more, and their stories of love, self-acceptance, resilience, and empowerment. Horror is having such a moment, and I'm so proud to publish into this genre with a collection that consists entirely of queer and trans authors. This, an this anthology is a bold, transformative celebration of queerness and the creatures that mostly go bump in the night. And sorry to tell you this has not come out until May, but we get to be excited in the process. <laughs> Next up, Winnie Nash is not your sunshine. No one does young YA LGBTQ plus literature like Nicole Mellaby, and she's done it again with Winnie Nash. Winnie is so not excited to spend the summer on the Jersey Shore with her grandmother. Not only are they basically strangers, but Winnie, who's always known she's gay, has been pushed into the metaphorical closet by her parents who worry what her grandma will think. So Winnie keeps quiet about the cute girls she befriends and dreams of the day that she can go to the Pride Parade in New York City. And she tries so hard to be an agreeable, selfless daughter, getting to NYC for Pride is feeling more and more like her only escape from a family who always needs her to smile. Winnie Nash is not your sunshine, and maybe it's time to show the world who she really is. The story is both heartbreaking and heartwarming, with themes of friendship, identity, mental wellness, and multi-generational relationships. This pub's in April 2nd, just in time for summer reading. Next slide. Fault Lines by Nora Shalway Carpenter. Ever since her beloved aunt died, Viv is aching to figure out where she belongs. Unfortunately, nobody in her rural West Virginia town has time for an assertive, angry girl. The only place Viv feels like it's safe to be her true self is a tree stand where her aunt taught her to hunt. So when fracking destroys the stand, Viv vows to find a way to take the gas company down. When Dex Matthews comes to town, a new kid whose mom lands a job laying pipeline, his and Viv's worlds collide and a friendship, or maybe more, slowly blossoms. But Viv's plan to sabotage the pipeline company could result in Dex's mom losing her job, putting them on the streets. This is a slow burn romance that deftly weaves in threads about socioeconomics, environmental activism, magic realism, and grief. Give it to your readers who love character-driven, thoughtful, deep stories that they can get lost in. And it's available now. Next slide. Just wanted to pause really quickly here. Oh, thank you, Chris. Uh, on Pretty Impossible Premise by Karen Rivers, which is all about the head spinning, can't stop thinking about you, Taylor Swift song level feelings. Um, and check out those two gorgeous star reviews it's received. Looking for a happily ever after teen romance? Pretty Impossible Premise is available now. Next slide. Oh, sorry, next slide there, thank you. Uh, so before we move on to a couple nonfiction, I'd like to call out three award-winning titles that will be available in paperback in 2024. Sugaring Off by Jillian French was a main North Star Award nominee. How You Grow Wings, a debut from Rima Onisetta, with which was a Kirkus and SLJ Best Book of the Year, and I'll Take Everything You Have by James Kleis, who's a librarian, uh, received a star review from Kirkus and was a Capital Choices nominee. Right, next slide. Right, and we have a couple of nonfiction titles. Here I Am, I and Me is an illustrated graphic novel style nonfiction adventure through the brain. I know that's a lot <laughs> that demystifies and destigmatizes 
emotional and mental health for children ages 12 and up, essential reading at a time when so many of our young people are feeling disconnected and hopeless about the state of the world. Next slide. Author illustrator Carrie Bean is a veteran high school art teacher who found that through art, her students felt safe exploring and releasing pent up emotions when they at times had difficulty articulating. And here I am, I am me. She masterfully discusses crucial topics like depression, substance abuse, and suicide, all while equipping readers with mind mindfulness tips, specific resources, and empathetic affirmations. I'm super proud to be publishing this title. I think it's one that we all need on our shelves and it pups in April. Okay, last book is Gender Rebels. History abounds with incredible trans, non-binary, and gender expansive people who have made incredible contributions to society and who have helped shape the world as we know it. 30 of these change makers get their time to shine in the spotlight in Gender Rebels. Next slide. Beyond celebrating the important impact trans, non-binary, and gender expansive people have had in the world, author Catherine Locke provides further insight into pronoun usage, the history of the word transgender, and more, with fascinating facts throughout. This book will, el will elucidate young adults on the history, legacy, and future of trans, gender expansive, and non-binary people and their rights at a time when protecting those rights is needed more than ever. Last slide. And that concludes the show's preview, just in time, I think. Our contact information is listed on the slide. Let us know if you have any needs or questions. Thank you so much. And on to, I believe, Macmillan. Yes, hello, thank you, Laura. Um, I am Amanda Camargo, the Senior Manager of Library Marketing at Macmillan, and I am just so excited to share some of our upcoming YA times with you. Uh, first off, these are all the ways you can get in touch with us. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions about the books I'm presenting, or just wanna say hi, or anything. Um, and now on to the books. First up is Infinity Alchemist. World Fantasy and National Book Award winner Case and Calendar brings us their exclusively original YA fantasy debut, a spellbinding dark academia novel about a quest that leads three young alchemists towards unexpected love and unimaginable power. With their signature prowess and unbridled creativity, acclaimed author Case and Calendar turns their formidable skill to a young adult fantasy for the first time. Featuring trans, queer, and polyamorous characters of color, this will be a book that many teens will be able to relate to. Next is Even If It Breaks Your Heart. This is a heart-buckling ride of a romance by beloved author Aaron Hahn. Winnie and Case couldn't be more different, but Case can't help but be inspired by Winnie's passion for horseback riding. And there's something about Case that makes Winnie want to try grasping onto a dream for herself. Case and Winnie's relationship is magnetic and their chemistry will make you fall in love right, inside, right alongside them. Next slide. Heartless Hunter is a dangerously romantic Scarlet Pimpernel inspired fantasy with post-revolution witches from acclaimed author Kristen Ziccarelli. This is the thrilling start to a romantic fantasy duology where the only thing more treacherous than being a witch is falling in love, featuring the ultimate enemies to lovers romance between a witch and a witch hunter, where a dangerous courtship ensues as they try to outwit one another and fall hard despite the consequences. Next. The Bad Ones. New York Times bestselling author Melissa Albert returns with a supernatural horror novel about four mysterious disappearances in a town haunted by a sinister magical history. An arresting crossover horror fantasy threaded with dark magic. The Bad Ones is a poison pen love letter to semi-toxic best friendship, the occult power of childhood play and artistic creation, and the razor thin line between make-believe and belief. Next is Hope of Blaze by Sarah Mughal Rana. All My Rage meets the Poet X in this electric debut that combines powerful prose and verse to explore a Muslim teen finding her voice in a post-9-11 America. Told through alternating prose and verse sections with a touch of magic, this debut is gripping, heartbreaking, often funny, and ultimately uplifting. In her unforgettable exploration of poetry, society, and self, Rana not only celebrates the Islamic faith and Pakistani culture, but simultaneously confronts racism and Islamophobia with unflinching bravery. Next is Ellie Haycott is Totally Normal. The Breakfast Club meets the perks of being a wildfire in this big-hearted debut novel from Gretchen Schreiber. Ellie Haycock has always hated her time spent in the hospital, but this stay is different. Ellie becomes close with a group of friends, including Ryan, a first-timer who's still optimistic about the doctors that Ellie stopped trusting years ago. Despite their differences, she can't seem to keep him out of her head. Ellie's life has never been normal, but maybe between these fast friendships and falling in love, she can find her own version of normal. Next is The Other Lola. 
the sequel to Ripley Jones' unforgettable YA thriller Missing Carissa. The other Lola is about what happens when the people you love most are the people you can trust the least. With Cam and Blair still struggling with the aftermath of, of their first mystery and with new secrets swirling between them, the stakes are higher than ever in this canon sequel. Next is Draw Down the Moon. New York Times bestsellers PC Cats and Krista Cass return with a new duology set in a dark and magical world filled with incredible danger and irresistible romance. Featuring a magic school, elementals, a mysterious death, and irresistible romance, plus a fantastic story and characters you can't help but root for, this duology is sure to be a hit. And the last title for me today is The Black Girl Survive in this one by Desiree S. Evans and Sarisha J. Fennell. This is a YA anthology of horror stories centering Black girls who battle monsters, both human and supernatural, and who survive to the end. Celebrating a new generation of best-selling and acclaimed Black writers, this anthology features 15 chilling and thought-provoking stories that place Black girls front and center as heroes and survivors, prepared to be terrified and left breathless. It features stories by Monica Brashears, Charlotte Cole Davis, L.L. McKinney, Brittany Morris, and more. And next slide, that is it for me. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Hello again, I'm Dina Sherman, the School and Library Marketing Director at Disney Publishing and I'm excited to show uh, share some of our great YA titles. All right, let's get into this. Oh, I can figure out how to make the slides move. All right, uh, so first up we've Make Me a Liar by Melissa Landers. Um, Veronica Mars is clearly having a comeback because I was going to say this is a sort of Veronica Mars, uh, but with a fantastical twist. So Tia Dante can solve all of your problems for a fee, of course. She has the genetic gift of the of transferable consciousness and can slip inside your mind and do your dirty work, whether it's humiliating your cheating boyfriend, telling your boss where to stick it, and then return your body with no one the wiser. Everything's going smoothly until Tia sees live video coverage of her own body murdering the town prosecutor in cold blood. So with the crime caught on camera and no concrete alibi, Tia is forced to ask her infuriatingly gorgeous ex to help clear her name and bring the criminal who hijacked her unconscious body to justice. So always excited to share new titles from our best-selling and award-winning Rick Riordan Presents imprint. Um, and I love that we're moving into the YA space in this imprint. Uh, so we have two new YA novels coming out. Obviously you just heard uh, great stuff from Sarah about It Waits in the Forest coming out in May. And then in January, we have A Drop of Venom by award-winning author Sajni Patel, which is uh, an unapologetically feminist retelling of Medusa but it's steeped in Indian mythology. So what Rick Riordan presents does best, and this is really an exciting read. Moving on, we have A Reckless Oath, which is the sequel to A Ruinous Fate, which came out last January, or yeah, last January. Um, action, romance, and magic abound as Cal and her friends, who are still stuck in the deadly never-ending forest, must deal with their losses and come to grips with their own part to play in the fates war ahead. This high fantasy duology is perfect for readers of Leah Bardugo and Holly Black, and it's filled with an expansive fantasy world, swoon-worthy romance, and a compelling ensemble cast that fans will fall in love with. So I love when my birthday falls on a Tuesday um, because all these great books come out, and I saw a bunch in our presentation, everybody else's presentations uh, on February 6th, so I, it always just makes that day a little bit more special. Um, King Cheer, coming out on my birthday, um, is the second book in our contemporary graphic novel series, Arden High, which reimagines Shakespeare's classics as queer dramedies. So what could be more dramatic than high school cheerleading? Um, so when Captain, Cheer Captain Leah steps down months before graduation, the team is shocked. Waitlisted by her dream college, questioning her identity, and suffering from senioritis, Leah needs to hand the captain's palms off and focus on her future. But when the competition for captaincy goes awry, power-hungry twins take command of the squad. Balls fly, pom-poms shake, hearts are broken, and only one person can heal the rift between the teams. But first, she will have to heal herself. So I grew up in the Northeast and had no idea that going to Disneyland before prom was a thing. But if you live in Southern California, apparently it is a big thing. So in Prom Chanted, which is by New York Times bestselling author Morgan Matson. Stella and Reese, who definitely do not get along, are on a pre-prom visit to the park when they accidentally push through a hidden door in Sleeping Beauty's castle. 
Suddenly they're not in Anaheim anymore. They're in Sleeping Beauty. Stella and Reese will have to put aside their differences to make sure Aurora and Philip fall in love and get the story back on track. Because if things don't end the way they're supposed to, they may never get home. So will they be able to pull off a fairy tale ending? And will Stella and Reese maybe get a happily ever after of their own? Gretchen McNeil is back with an all new thriller, four letter word. Going into her senior year, Izzy is counting down the days until she can leave her humdrum life behind until Alberto, a handsome and mysterious Italian exchange student, shows up for his stay with her family. Izzy, and everyone else, is immediately charmed by Alberto and his irresistible accent. As an avid true crime fan, Izzy's been following a serial killer case in San Francisco, and the murderer, whose description does bear a passing resemblance to the Italian exchange student living in her house, seems to be making his way up north. When a local girl is murdered, Izzy thinks Alberto might not be who he seems. And in a race against the clock, she must convince anyone who will listen that Alberto could be a notorious killer before another girl ends up dead. And lastly, I just wanted to share a few of our franchise favorites for you. Um, so The Lost Ones by best-selling author Lauren Stefano is the second book in our new Disney Villains series, which is uh, it's called The Dark Ascension, and it's face, it, it sort of deals with villains and their siblings. So The Lost Ones is the untold story of teenage Captain Hook and his twin sister Marlene. Bet you didn't know he had a sister, did you? Uh, on, moving on to Star Wars, The High Republic continues with Phase 3, with Defy the Storm by Tessa Grattan and Destina Ireland. And Fate Be Changed by best-selling author Farrah Rashan is the newest installment in our best-selling Twisted Tales series, this time taking on Brave with the question of what if the witch gave Merida a different spell? And that's it for me. Thank you. As everyone said, thank you for joining us. These are all the ways you can find us. Um, most of our books are up on NetGalley and Edelweiss, but always, if you need a print copy, reach out. I do sometimes have them. And now over to you, Chris. Thank you, Dina. And hello again, librarians. This is Chris Vicari of Union Square and Company here again. And I begin with two titles just released. First is For Girls Who Walk Through Fire by debut author Kim DeRose about a group of teen girls who form a coven to seek justice on their sexual assaulters. The diverse cast reflects a range of survivor experiences, and throughout the book, it's their friendships, family members, and personalities that are more in focus than their trauma. Booklist called it a bold and compassionate debut. Also just out now on the next slide is A Bright Heart by Kate Chen Lee, the book that asks, what if you could avenge your own murder? Murdered by the man she loved, the man she made king, our heroine, Ming Shin, gets that chance for revenge. One day, waking up two years earlier, swearing to prevent this man named Ren from ever becoming king. With shifting alliances, betrayals, and maybe the chance to fall in love again, Ming Shin is a strategic thinking heroine who grows through many challenges, so to avoid repeating past mistakes. Kirk has said Kate Chen Li is a fresh and compelling voice, and Booklist added, this book will appeal to any reader who loves fantasy with a good mix of romance, ancient Chinese court politics, and magic. Book two in the series in June of 24. Next is Red. You heard from Annie Cardi on the next slide, please, a few moments ago. So just a reminder for her book where she tackles issues surrounding reproductive rights and the impact of community from the perspective of a Christian teenager named Tess who learns to find her voice again. We think Red will be a much talked about book in 2024. Next slide, please. Dead Endia, The Divine Order by Hamish Steele, a graphic novel and third in the popular Dead Endia trilogy, brings back our team, led by Barney, a trans teen who, with friends and fellow teenage theme park employees, team up with other unlikely heroes to fight a battle between angels and demons for the fate of the entire universe, all while dealing with the gravest threats any young adult could ever face, that being complications in their love life. The books were adapted into a Netflix show called Dead End Paranormal Park that started in 2022, and this is the long-awaited ending to that trilogy. Next slide, please. Now, Conjurers. It's 1999. This book opens in the woods of Massachusetts with the discovery of a corpse, it being the partially devoured body of the school star quarterback. 
also Secret Witch, and even more Secret First, true love of a local teen named Nesbet Nunez, both part of a town coven started by queer kids who had dealt with homophobia within their town. No one immediately knew why this brilliant, gentle quarterback had passed on, but now remaining members of their coven vow to get answers, one being, how come the necklace he never took off is missing from his body? But nothing will prepare them for the terrifying battle ahead, which includes a twisted red-gloved monster in the local cemetery that will need to be confronted to get the truth. Truth being that this star QB found dead fought until his last breath, and that before he died, he left behind the key to the monster's destruction. Now Conjurers is a murder mystery that will work for YA romance readers, especially lovers of queer romance. Author Freddie Kolsch lives where better than to write this book in Salem, Massachusetts. Now Conjurers is her first novel, and she will be speaking on a TLA 2024 panel. Next is the Lies of Alma Blackwell with a cover to come. Amanda Glaze's debut YA called The Second Death of Edie and Violet Bond was praised as an impressive and eerie debut. Here, Amanda explores a seaside haunted house, loosely inspired by the Winchester Mystery House in California, a real-life Gothic-style mansion. In this book, 16-year-old witch Nev Blackwell is up for continuing the family tradition of protecting their town from vengeful spirits, ready to give up her future and take over for her ailing grandmother as the town's witch protector. But when a stranger named Finn arrives at the Blackwell house in response to a job listing, Nev offers him the job, but soon comes not to trust him. He knows more than he's letting on about this house, as well as terrible secrets about Nev herself that she did not even know. Dark family histories and a legacy of lies force Nev and Finn to come together to rewrite a tragic history. Next slide, please. In spring 2024, we launch a new program here we are calling Everyone Can Be a Reader. The program includes 15 titles to start, all in April 24, across a wide spectrum of subjects, age, and interest levels. Its goal is to break down barriers to reading for those children who struggle to read due to dyslexia or visual stress or even just a reluctance to engage with books. These will fit the high-low teen readership. One series within this program is Anthony McGowan's series of four novels, Brock, Pike, Rook, and Lark, about working class teenagers, one named Nikki, and his special needs older brother, Kenny. They have a problematic family life, as well as the usual trouble with friends and girlfriends and school, but they always strive to do the right thing, and we follow them through the struggles and golden moments of their adventures. Next slide, please. And a reminder, if you wish to bring classics to your teen patrons, please consider our classics at Union Square and Company. We continue in hardcover with six new titles so they can make great replacements for your current physical or even digital shelves. Such that I've been told will appeal to teens with these gorgeous covers. Orlando by Virginia Woolf, just one of the six new titles ahead. Next slide, please. That's my name, that's my contact information and my friends, those are the books. And that's the way it is on Thursday, November 9th, 2023, bringing to a close our third annual Get Your YA On Author Showcase and Book Buzz Preview event. My thanks to authors Annie Cardi, Sarah Das, Johnny Garzavia, and Samantha Mabry for taking the time to talk about their books here today. And on behalf of Dina at Disney, Amanda at McMillan, Laura at Hachette, and me, Chris at Union Square and Company, I say thanks for joining us. Have a nice rest of the day and we'll see you at the library one day soon.